Done. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this first uh, webinar of the CS3 Mesh for EOS project, uh, a webinar about science mesh and its applications. So we will perhaps give uh, one more minute of extra time for people who are still arriving to this webinar. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, let me introduce uh, the, um, the, the presenters. So my name is Jakub Mościcki. I am from CERN, from the storage group in the IT department, and I'm the coordinator of the CS3 Mesh for EOSC project. Then we have Pedro Ferreira, who is uh, 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 leading the work package one, so the project management, and he's also the technical coordinator of the project. Uh, we have, um, he's from CERN, IT department as well. Then we have Maciej Brzeźniak from PSNC in Poland, who is coordinating the work package for users and applications. Uh, and uh, Marcin Sieprawski from uh, Software Mind uh, uh, in Krakow, Poland, who is leading the task on data science environment in the WP4 uh, work package, as well as Guido Aben from Arnet based in the Netherlands, uh, who is uh, uh, leading the task on open data systems and metadata um, in uh, WP4. So let's get started. I will share my slides now. I hope this is visible. So welcome everyone. Um, let me first do a very quick introduction uh, that will explain a little bit where our project comes from and also demystify a little bit the name of the project CS3 Mesh for EOSC. Uh, our project is uh, taking uh, on board all the developments that have been happening since 2014 in a community which is called CS3, which is uh, providing file sync and share services which are operated on premises across Europe, but also beyond by numerous research labs, entrance universities and companies. And we have been uh, holding um, uh, annual meetings of this community since 2014. And there's around 130 organizations that have been involved in this community uh, and um, providing more than 30 service nodes. So the services that are deployed on premises in more than, 20, uh, in, in more than 25 countries. And this is a sizable, sizable community. Uh, counting the number of users, there's more than 400,000 active users of this, of this distributed infrastructure um, and uh, providing these services are providing more than 16 petabytes of data and uh, more than 3 billion objects. So our project comes as, a, um, as an effort to bring this ongoing, um, this, this, uh, th this community of practice into, into the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, what is also important is that this community, these services are not only providing data and, um, and storage, uh, but there's also a lot of interest and actually interesting work, technical work and services that provide user environments and higher level applications, such as editors, data, uh, applications for data analysis, metadata tagging transfers, and so on. So if you'd like to know more about this background, um, uh, there is a link here uh, where you can find all the community events. Um, could, uh, Jakub, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I think we don't see you changing your slide set. We still see the cover. Maybe you would like to try to stop sharing and start sharing again. Can you see this again? Uh, now we can see, yeah. Okay. You... Okay. So perhaps we can, I can try to go to the presentation mode again. 
Can you see it? No, I'm only gray, only gray. It's a bit gray, gray yeah. Now it's gray. <laughs> okay, so I will essentially like continue it. in this mode. Yeah, still okay. <laughs> uh, let me just do like this. Okay, so as I said, we have this community of practice, and what we are uh, doing with our project is we are bringing this this uh, this uh, this set of existing services uh, to form a global collaboration platform for researchers, which we call Science Mesh, and this is integrating the existing data uh, that is existing on the services and also tools. And here we are talking about open data and open source tools, and we provide this Science Mesh platform to the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, and uh, uh, just and you will you will you will have more details shortly from Pedro and other colleagues about what we do precisely. I just want to highlight one fact that we in this project we also take this very same open and bottom up approach that was proved very successful in the CS3 community. Mm -hmm. Namely we are working very closely with user communities uh, analyzing and taking existing best practices, services, and technologies, we improve them. We uh, we uh, add interoperability to them, and we open up this for other scientific communities. So what you will see here is examples from part uh, particular uh, user communities, but uh, with um, possibility to use it in other applications. So. The, on the agenda, we have uh, Pedro Ferreira talking about uh, Science Mesh uh, and giving the overview of, of this uh, new infrastructure. Then Maciej will talk about core applications in the federated layer of Science Mesh. Then Marcin on, uh, will give us a walkthrough on collaborative data science environments uh, in high energy physics, but also beyond. And finally, Guido will uh, walk us through uh, what is happening in uh, the endangered linguistics applications and, and, and community uh, with the emphasis on guaranteeing long-term usefulness thanks to metadata. So just a short reminder, there will be time for questions and answers at the, at the end of this webinar. So we welcome your questions. We encourage you to participate and this meeting is recorded and the recordings will be made publicly available. So please do take note of, of this. And here I would like also to, to thank our uh, support team for organizing this, uh, this webinar. So our colleagues from Trust IT Services, who is the partner of, 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 of the project. So with that, now I give um, stage to uh, Pedro Ferreira to start with uh, his presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Kuba. I'll start by sharing my presentation. I hope you are seeing it now. If not, please shout. Okay, so um, as Kuba said, the goal of this presentation is to give you a bit of an overview um, on uh, Science Mesh. And uh, I will also use it as a way to um, introduce some of the presentations which are coming um, next. So I will uh, try also to provide you um, uh, with some um, uh, with some concepts uh, to clarify some of the concepts concepts which uh, you will need to understand some of the um, presentations which will come next. So uh, science mesh. So Cuba has already explained uh, it uh, from a very high level uh, point of view. So the idea is to create a decentralized mesh of enterprise uh, file sync and share nodes. So we're, we're talking of the, uh, um, the sync and share nodes which currently exist in, the, uh, uh, in, in these institutions around the world, such as the institutions which are part of the CS3 uh, community and which currently exist in isolation. So basically there's almost no um, synergies between these different nodes which are spread around the world. Uh, and the idea is to try to leverage on uh, a mesh, on basically an infrastructure, um, uh, which would 
uh, interconnect these these uh, these nodes and create um, a federated environment where researchers can collaborate transparently. So users of one node will be able to communicate with users on other another node, and they will be able to share files, and they will be able to um, uh, basically uh, collaborate with each other. All of these uh, would be based on open standards and open source software. And the idea would be that on top of this um, platform, you would be able to uh, run uh, applications um, and distributed uh, collaborative tools. So in, in a more visual way, you, we can look at it as um, this diagram shows uh, with uh, the sync and share platforms at the bottom. At the top, you have the applications and research services we want to empower the scientific community with. And in the middle, that's where the magic happens. So on one hand, we have a federation with uh, very well-defined rules and where we know what we basically expect from each other. And then uh, on the other hand, we've got the interoperability platform, which is a much more technical component, which of course we will not go into detail uh, today, maybe for a future webinar. Uh, or similar event, but it's basically based on, let's say, two uh, on two technologies. There's on one hand OCM, which is the uh, uh, set of standards which allow uh, nodes on the mesh to communicate um, basically with each other. And uh, this is a standard which is already actually adopted by, by, by the major vendors uh, on cloud and next cloud, for instance, already implemented. And we are um, extending it and we are adding uh, basically things to it to allow for uh, this vision that we're trying to implement. And then uh, there are the CS3 APIs. These are basically, this, this is basically the language which allows applications to talk to storage backends. Uh, so it's a common language for integration across the mesh of, of, of this application layer. And uh, since applications right now do not speak yet, they do not all speak this, this, this language yet, we have uh, uh, an interoperability platform and uh, Riva is the package which implements this, uh, which bridges the existing protocols with the CS3 APIs. So this is a very rough uh, um, overview of it. Uh, then at the top of the, of the layer cake, we have the applications which will be the object of much as uh, talk is going to go over them and group them in uh, in different uh, functional areas, uh, and the main then uh, um, the main uh, 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 goal of this of this webinar is actually to give you uh, some insight on two of these uh, use cases. That's the open data uh, fair. Uh, and uh, research data management uh, part, uh, which will be uh, uh, the, the, the object of um, uh, Guido's presentation. And then there's the part of high energy uh, physics data analysis, and that's going to be uh, uh, matching. So I would like to finish just by um, encouraging you to um, join the mesh. So basically, uh, the our test infrastructure is already in place. I'll be honest with you. If you join it, there isn't yet that much to to, to play with. There aren't there aren't that many applications right now to use right away um, as it is. But you can you will already show up on our dashboard, and uh, you will already get an idea of how this process works and how uh, easy it is actually to 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 do this. Um, there are already applications for next cloud and on cloud which allow you to do this, and you can find all that information uh, on our uh, website, sciencemesh.io. There's a documentation area with pretty uh, uh, clear guides on how to do that. Otherwise, you can uh, contact us on Gitter on our community chat room. And there's also our GitHub uh, organization where you can find all the repositories and all the technology we are currently working on. And I think that's all I had for you. Uh, so let's um, move on to um, to our colleagues. We will give you some more uh, details. Thank you very much, Pedro. I just would like to say that in case uh, uh, you uh, there are questions in the audience, you may also want to type them into the chat window, and we will answer them later. So now to Maciej to explain us a little bit more about the core applications in the Science Mesh. Yeah. 
We cannot hear you, Maciej. Okay, I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, can you say, can you see my screen, my yes. slides? Yes. All right. Uh, so uh, my, my role today is to introduce you into the applications uh, we are covering in, um, in C3 Mesh uh, using and bringing together uh, using the federation layer. So we've got four core applications defined in the project, and this slides uh, like overviews them on a very high level. Uh, so starting from data science environments through open data systems, uh, we also which are very um, used in kind of uh, specific and specialized use cases, which will be presented today. Uh, we support um, uh, collaborative documents editing and also transferring your data on demand uh, uh, within the federation. A uh, short uh, description of each of the applications uh, would be that um, for data science environments, uh, as you may I guess, we're mostly focusing on the on enabling to run the data science applications on top of, on top of the sync and share systems. So, which is already possible today. I mean, we can run uh, uh, things like Jupyter in front of um, in front of. Um, uh, uh, storage systems. However, the added value of the uh, of this uh, of the uh, science mesh project will be to enable the um, collaborative data science. By collaborative, we mean that scientists uh, from different uh, places they can go together and using the same data sets and also the same set or and common set of applications they can do the uh, perform the data science uh, related activities uh, within their home organization from one uh, end but using the data which are easily shared and exchanged on the other end. Uh, in the open data systems context, uh, we mostly focus on, at least uh, in general, uh, we focus on um, enabling uh, openness of the data. We see that in, in many cases, the sync and share systems and the storage systems are the first stage where people use the temporary data which they curate and then make them open by depositing to several kinds of repositories and, uh, and external systems. What we're doing in uh, Science Mesh is to enable users to work on the metadata which enrich the data sets uh, directly in their home uh, storage systems, think and share systems, and also in, we're trying to enable depositing these uh, curated data sets and nicely and easily to the repositories. So it's uh, uh, from one hand enabling the curation itself, on the other is integration with uh, the, the uh, repository, external repository systems. Uh, these are kind of specialized use cases, uh, which we will present today in details. And in addition to that, uh, we're working on some kind of, uh, I would call them general purpose use cases. Uh, all of us are using um, uh, online collaboration tools for documents editing. This is a very popular um, approach today to use these uh, things in the cloud. We're proposing to use this um, to uh, apply this uh, approach uh, by, uh, but uh, use it uh, and apply it in the uh, home organization, so on premise systems, and lots of sites uh, within CS3 community, but also in the CS3 mesh project. Uh, we're having uh, the collaborative, collaborative editing uh, tools which are integrated locally. Uh, these are different tools, uh, just to mention things like Open uh, uh, Only Office, CodeMD, and so on. So uh, the, the added value of the project is that to enable, uh, again, a collaborative uh, implementation of this workflow. Uh, we also enable people to use uh, the software, the editing software, which might be not present in their sites. And also we would like to facilitate the data exchange behind the uh, collaborative editing uh, tools uh, front end. And last use case is on uh, transferring um, the data, the large data sets, uh, which not always can uh, be processed locally uh, in uh, scientific, in many scientific uh, use cases, as such as, for instance, uh, um, for instance, low for, but also high energy physics and others, you, you know it very well. Uh, we've got this problem of um, uh, enabling data to compute facilities locality. 
And the, the purpose of the integration of this workflow in, in, in CS FreeMesh is that we would like to en enable users to, de uh, to deal with these problems easily in a transparent way. So that they don't have to transfer data manually between sites and using the fact that sites are federated using the sync and share level federation, the, the federation layer which Pedro uh, presented, we would like to enable easy data uh, moving for uh, high, uh, high performance processing. You can find more details and explanations of the, um, still on the high level, but quite interesting on the uh, link which I uh, put it to the uh, bottom of the slide. Uh, recalling for a while uh, some icons and pictures which Pedro already shown, I tried to let you uh, know what kind of tools and applications, in actual applications you're using in particular context. So uh, in data science environments, you will see the details, uh, but it's, it's, it's needed to mention tools such as JupyterLab and Swan environment, which is developed on CERN. On open data systems, we will be using uh, row crate uh, standard and also uh, repositories which are from one hand open but also institutional repositories such as Skibo. Uh, on collaborative document sites we're using uh, tools like uh, CodeMD, uh, Collabora Online. We're working on integration of Overleaf and only Office. On the uh, data transfer side uh, we're using uh, tools like AirClone, Arclone and FT FTS and also uh, planning to use Ruscio. Uh, many of these tools are actually developed also by members of this community, which is uh, which adds, uh, adds additional expertise to the um, and capital of knowledge to the uh, CSGMesh consortium. So uh, yeah, this helps us to perform this, uh, these integrations. So I will perhaps skip this slide uh, as my time is running, but this um, is for to show you that we're not um, like uh, building things from the scratch. I mean, uh, for federation layer itself, we're using, um, uh, from one hand, we're using pre-existing technologies such as for AI, we're, we're taking benefits of the fact that many sites are uh, already in EduGain. Uh, we're uh, defined the C3 uh, APIs uh, within the project, but also as a result of previous collaborations uh, within the C3 community. The let's say, incarnation, incarnation, the first incarnation of C3 API is Riva, the, the platform developed at CERN. And you might have seen before the open cloud mesh uh, concept and logo and name, uh, as it is a basic uh, standard for uh, and a vendor neutral protocol for uh, sharing the data uh, and synchronizing the data between different uh, sync and share systems provided by different vendors. Also a uh, kind of the result of the previous work of uh, members of this community. And we're uh, running out of time. Yeah. Already. Okay. So fin finishing up, this is a full stack of the uh, of the applications. Uh, on one hand, applications. Uh, on the other hand, federation uh, solutions and also cloud storage, which is sync and share uh, systems. We're using and also actually integrating within the project. And last but not least, um, coming back to my first slide. We will be, uh, in a minute, we'll be hearing about the collaborative uh, data science environments uh, in the context of high energy physics. This will be a presentation given by Marcin. And then uh, we will uh, talk about data openness uh, and sure, uh, enabling uh, in the context of endangered uh, languages, uh, in, uh, which is actually paradisic, related to paradisic uh, project and community presented by Kido. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maciej. I see there is some raised hands. Perhaps uh, if you have questions, maybe you can uh, type them in the chat or perhaps we'll take them at the QAA session. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Let's move on. Martin, please. Okay, can you hear my slide? Can you hear me and see my slide? Yes. Both uh, positive. <laughs> both positive. Okay, my name is Marcin Cieprawski. In Software Mind, I lead Big Data Lab, uh, an R&D group uh, focusing on uh, data-driven innovation, uh, scalable systems, and uh, and uh, data science. Uh, as Kuba mentioned, uh, in CS3 Mesh for Ask project, I lead the task for distributed uh, data science environments. And uh, here I'll talk about uh, collaborative data science in high energy physics uh, use case. Uh, why it doesn't change? 
Okay, uh, I want to start with a disclaimer. So this is not a high energy physics talk. And also it doesn't cover all the, all the picture of processing uh, data uh, from detectors in high energy physics. Uh, it will be focused on, on the parts that uh, data science environments can be useful in, in, in the research. Uh, so I want to show why uh, the, the high energy physics use case is very good to, for, to show uh, science mesh distributed data science environments uh, usefulness. Uh, I present the tools uh, that we provide to, uh, for, for this uh, and also mention why it is relevant in a wider perspective. So, so this, the same uh, tools and, uh, and experience can be transferred to uh, other areas. And also I want to get, get feedback. So to, to address uh, a, a variety of attendees, uh, there will be some um, introduction to the use case and uh, to um, data science, uh, but also there will be some, uh, some details on the, on the uh, solutions we, we develop. Uh, starting very basic uh, on defining uh, high energy physics use case. Uh, so scientists use particle accelerators to smash particles together and very high speeds uh, in the search for new particles. Uh, so this involves uh, identifying events uh, in, in a lot of noise. Uh, and this is uh, done by analyzing data streams from detectors. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider in CERN is the world's biggest uh, particle accelerator. Uh, and, and these experiments, uh, the analysis is done by uh, uh, by uh, scientists in institutions all over the world. So, so uh, the environment is uh, uh, distributed. Uh, Large Hadron Collider pro produces a lot of data. So the raw stream from detectors is about 600 terabytes per second or 50,000 petabytes per day. Of course, uh, uh, only a fraction of this is stored, so total data stored is about 350 petabytes. Uh, so filtering needs to be really very fast. Um, and uh, in uh, this stored data, the, uh, the analysis is done, as I mentioned, with uh, teams of scientists from all over the world. Uh, so one of the uh, challenges is providing tools for distributed in this in a distributed environment for uh, data science uh, actions. Data science uh, became famous about a decade ago uh, after an article in Harvard Business Review, which coined data scientists as the sexiest uh, job in the 21st century. Uh, in business, uh, data science is defined uh, as using data to increase competitive advantage. Uh, there were many uh, uh, data analytics approaches last, in last decades. Uh, in business, data warehouse, business intelligence, data mining, a lot of them. Uh, but this one mentions science. This is because uh, we can see it as using the methods and tools that uh, are used in research to analyze any kind of any kind of data. So most of these uh, methods uh, were invented for for physics, uh, and many approaches used in data science, for instance, machine learning. Uh, was used in uh, high energy physics long before it, it became uh, popular in, in let's say, uh, mainstream uh, development. One of those tools is, is Jupyter Notebook, which is open source interactive web-based tool that we can, uh, we can uh, in a single document, we can put uh, the code, the software code, the results of, of computation, some explanatory text or, or comments, and multimedia or rich output. Uh, this uh, uh, tool, Jupyter, uh, was uh, just exploded in popularity in last years. This rapid uptake is supported by, by enthusiastic community of users. Uh, last year, there were uh, 10 million uh, public Jupyter notebooks on GitHub. And uh, Jupyter became de facto number one platform from data scientists to build uh, applications and also work with big data and, and uh, artificial intelligence. Also, it started uh, replacing, uh, say, traditional business intelligence tools. So an open source uh, tool 
uh, starts being playing a bigger and bigger ro role in, in business. Uh, CERN developed uh, uh, their own um, Jupyter Notebook service, SWAN. Uh, it is uh, it provides a, a convenient integration with existing resources, for instance, uh, EOS storage. Uh, I need to give credit here. I use this slide courtesy of my CERN colleagues, and also I wanted to recommend uh, SWAN uh, workshop and, and resources. For instance, SWAN Gallery uh, provides a rich library of uh, um, notebook examples useful in high energy physics. Uh, in distributed data science environments uh, in Science Mesh, we use uh, uh, we developed the uh, Jupyter Lab extension, uh, which integrates uh, uh, Jupyter Lab with uh, Science Mesh interoperability platform. Uh, so we can provide file browsing and sharing uh, functionalities uh, in federated uh, uh, multi cloud. Uh, for the, the front end part, this is. Uh, uh, this, this additional functionality is available in, in the file browser. Uh, so they are uh, shared by me, shared with me tabs, uh, sharing buttons and entries in context menu. And also, of course, you, you can uh, uh, do file browsing. The user can, uh, can create a notebook, uh, put some useful code there, and then share it with a collaborator and this uh, another person opens their uh, Jupyter uh, lab and and can see uh, this uh, notebook in in the shared uh, with me uh, tab can open it change it and the original author can can see it and many people can can um, edit and work on on the same uh, document for the uh, for the backend, uh, more technically, this if this just uh, provides or expo exposes some uh, REST uh, endpoints for uh, for the front end uh, functionalities, uh, and from the other hand, it's it's uh, integrated with uh, interoperability platform with uh, CS3 APIs. Uh, so this is uh, uh, this functionality is already uh, ready to use. You can you can check it out. Uh, this is work in progress. So since uh, CS3 conference in uh, uh, that that I presented the first uh, version of of this plugin, uh, we implemented a new file browser, uh, user information. So so uh, files the sharing can be can be done uh, with users by name. And also for concurrent updating of notebooks, uh, the locking mechanism is already in place. Currently, we work on porting the, the plugin to Jupyter Lab 3 and uh, com concurrent uh, updating of notebooks, including merging the, uh, the, the codes. And as I mentioned, uh, you are invited to provide any, uh, any comments, any feedback is uh, welcome. So uh, speaking about using in, in, a, uh, in a wider perspective in other sectors, uh, so this uh, distributed data science environment can be used in, in uh, any uh, scientific discipline as uh, any area now in science uh, is based on analysis of data and Jupyter originally um, developed in science, it, it's, it's popular in, in in many uh, many uh, scientific uh, research areas, uh, it can support uh, collaboration also between between various institutions. It can also be useful in uh, business uh, environment, uh, so it can support uh, developing new products. Uh, Softomind uses uh, Jupyter in uh, applications in finance, Internet of Things, smart cities, uh, pharma, earth observations. We also uh, included uh, data science environment in our agile uh, process. Um, and uh, I think that, that this will be really uh, important next uh, in next years. Uh, I last 20 years uh, I worked uh, in 
uh, data-driven innovation with all possible buzzwords that in that area that happens uh, uh, like big data, uh, data, uh, data science, uh, um, data warehouse, ETL, data mining, semantic web, whatever. So I have some reasons to think that uh, this uh, conclusion uh, of mine can be can be correct. But you probably trust Gartner more. So in uh, recent reports uh, published a couple of weeks ago, critical capabilities for data science and machine learning platforms. Uh, Gartner uh, indicates that uh, collective intelligence in data science uh, and cloud-based AI infrastructure uh, will be one of the key factors uh, for success and uh, uh, for, for competitive advantage. So this is all uh, for, from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh... Uh, let's uh, let's move on to Guido, and then we'll have uh, roughly ten minutes for 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 questions. So please unshare your screen, Martin. Uh, just this is new share, post share. No, stop share is here. Okay. Okay. So that's that's when I can start, right? Yes, please, please do. Beautiful. Look at us wrangling digital technology like masters. <laughs> Just a minute, there we go. I move to present mode. That should have worked. Yes, it does. Perfect, beautiful. All right. Um, this one is slightly different to the previous talks in that this is us, the CS3 Mesh for EOSC project, uh, humbly rediscovering and reusing what uh, the, the road that other people have paved before us. It is. Um, very much in part around uh, what we've learned from uh, endangered languages as uh, as collated and um, put together in a project called Paradisic. I'll speak about that in a minute. It starts though from the observation, I'm speaking on behalf of Arnett, but I'm fairly sure that our uh, uh, observations are mirrored by all the other participant nodes, that we started out running a, uh, a sync and share service very much as a research scratch space, um, essentially for the, the research equivalent of uh, internet memes and cat pictures, et cetera. But it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew. And eventually we, we figured out that we weren't hosting scratch spaces anymore. We were hosting entire research departments collections. And that, um, as beautiful as it is, but it comes with an onus, it comes with a duty of care. And we began to realize, wait a minute, we are now responsible, uh, willy or nilly, for the entire life cycle of data here. And we, we came to realize that we, we, would, we were very good at the ingest part, uh, but we weren't really providing users with anything at the expunge part. And yet, if we were to do that, suppose we picked up that gauntlet and did it, we'd actually be aiding and abetting the whole open science agenda as a building block, not absolutely not as the uh, the end all cure all of the whole system, but um, we'd be we'd be adding a building block, so we'd, we'd move from being a blocker to an enabler. And the workflow really should be quite simple to begin with, right? Um, we've already got the files; just allow users to package them up, annotate them, and push them out to a repository or an archive. I'm sure this could be polished, but as a first instance, that would be a beautiful flow. Why would you do that? Well not only because packaging it up and allowing users to publish makes life easier for them but also because as the as the the repository or the the sync and share system that has been collecting the files you actually you've already automatically looked at a lot of relevant metadata that you could be making available to the packages you've seen who started the file who edited the file what dates they did this at you could find out what instruments have worked on the files. You could see group information, all kinds of inter interesting stuff that you could um, automatically harvest and make available to users. That way, when a particular research group is no longer interested in the data they have deposited in your system, when the next group comes around and are interested in that data, they don't have to second guess why this was ever packaged. It's already present in the metadata. Now, 
we have enough on our plates and we realize that we're not experts. So instead of cobbling something together ourselves, I hope there's a, a number of sighs of relief among the audience, particularly with people who, who know their stuff around fair. Fortunately, they didn't invent their own wheel. So we looked around and um, it turns out that there are standards. Um, you have to make a choice. So we, we picked what to us seemed like the most active and relatively lightweight and relatively fit for purpose uh, set of standards. Uh, we're focusing on uh, the work being done around our oak crate. Also because it's so extensible, um, it doesn't just look at, it doesn't just have in mind in its crosshairs the packageability of mealy files, but they're looking at um, workflows, they're looking at um, uh, instrument metadata, etc. In fact, um, pinging back to Martin's talk around Jupyter Notebooks, you could package up the complete output of a Jupyter Notebook, package it up as a crate and turn that into reproducible science. Leaping ahead of what we are actually doing, but the, the standards we're embracing seem to be capable of doing these sorts of things. Like I said, obviously uh, it wasn't us, right? So um, me representing on it, we had existing relationships with uh, a number of people active in this field. And what to us seemed like the luminary example is a, an endangered languages project called Paradisic. And some of the people who have been long working on Paradisic are long-standing collaborators of Arnett. So we invited them to join us in the definition of how we want to do FAIR on top of the uh, second share systems. Why then, you might ask, why is a, an endangered languages project so interesting to um, to base the, the FAIR efforts of a distributed sync and share mesh on? Well, that's because in endangered languages, um, they can't rely on the contents of the file for searchability and, um, and general accessibility. These are, in their raw state, these are very unstructured files. They are audio interviews, they are old lab books, maybe just the JPEGs. Um, you really rely on whoever uploads the, uh, the, the file sets to do as much annotation as they can on them while they upload the packages. Otherwise, uh, the next set of researchers wanting to reuse the files have nothing to base themselves on. What tells you that a particular, a particular old style uh, AVI video might be interesting for you unless there is metadata to tell you where it was recorded, what languages it is from, etc. So Paradisec already has a requirement to look at, um, to, 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 to be able to display and ingest data based on metadata and catalog it that way. Another thing around Paradisec is that it relies heavily on community ingest of data. It is a it is itself a distributed project. It doesn't just sit at a single university. They can't rely on a single university's or a single um, data custodian's infrastructure. It needs to be able to be redeployed quite easily and it needs to ingest data sets from a disparate set of users at various institutions. So centralized quality control, centralized um, enforcement of uh, ICT standards is not so much impossible, but impractical. So it's very much it's very much up to the people depositing data to do as much as the annotation as they can themselves, of course, while being guided into uh, proper quality control as much as you can by, this, by the, um, the tool set. And fortunately for us, fortunately for the CS3 Mesh project, very recently, the people behind Paradisic and the people that we have contracted to work on CS3 Mesh for EOSC um, as well, uh, did a, an entire revamp of both the, um, the repository site as well as the metadata annotation tools. So we were in a position, and this is all web-based, right? So the, the, entire, the entire platform is, is born, uh, uh, born on the web. So it was quite easy for us to ask them to work with us and redeploy those tools, not for Paradisec as an archive, but for the CS3 mesh nodes, uh, treating them as pseudo, pseudo uh, repositories. You will see that if you dive deeper into um, the structure of the Paradisic site, um, it has extensive metadata, extensive searchability, um, extensive annotation capabilities. And the tool they've written to do this um, pick up files, uh, select, a, um, select a particular schema profile and describe your data is called Describo. 
And um, as you can tell, the workflow that they have in mind is rather similar to the workflow I described in slide one and we'll come back to at the very last slide. This tool written under the uh, aegis of uh, University of Technology Sydney uh, is open source and um, very much based on web deployability. So fits the framework in CS3 mesh for EOSC very much. Um, diving deeper into the innards of Describo, you, you can see that it, it allows users to do all of, almost all of the, uh, the curation and self-description themselves while guiding them into good practices. The slides will be available afterwards, so I won't dwell on this too long. Um, now, how does this whole thing fit into the workflow that we had in mind? Another uh, beautiful serendipity in that one of our project partners, um, the Westfälische Wilhelms Universität Münster, happens to be in another project where they were tasked at looking into making it easy for their researchers to deposit data. So linking the two projects. Their project is called Skibo RDS, which basically is the workflow I described in slide number one, pick up files, annotate them and push them out. They are writing all of those components, but for the edit your metadata, number, numbers two and three, they are now using Describo as the tool. So what we have here is um, users are, are, are able to, in, inside of their native sync and share store, select a, a helper tool that will allow them to define a project, select files, it then launches Describo. Describo allows them to annotate according to standards, according to correct procedures. A, an RO crate is formed, again, according to standards and procedures. These are all readable through external services as well and ought to be completely standards compliant um, as, uh, as future systems develop. And then number four, there are plugins there that pushes out this crate and deposits it correctly into a variety of backend systems. We're starting with Zenodo simply because soon is one of our project partners and it makes it easy to verify the workflow on both ends of the deal. Uh, there's a plugin to OSF, the Open Science Foundation. And uh, we're looking into standardizing the, um, the expunge system as well through Sword V3 which again, uh, the consultants that we have um, contracted with are well-versed in. I should have uh, finished on a slide like Martin did, where it says you are completely welcome to pick up all of the packages and the uh, the GitHubs are all open and free. They are, I just uh, I just forgot to do that, my bad. But ping me if you're very interested and I'll, uh, I'll let you in on how the whole thing works. Well, that should be my 12 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Guido. Thank you very much. Sure. So, um, I think this concludes our round of presentations. And uh, um, uh, we have time for several questions. Uh, and uh, I see that there is already one hand raised from Karina. So perhaps, Karina, you would like to pick up a mic and, and um, and ask your question or comment. Um, oh, are we having some kind of a audio problem? I can hear you. No, but I cannot he hear Karina. Okay, perhaps there's another raised hand, so perhaps we can try with uh, with Silvana now uh, to check whether the system works. Silvana, could you could you pick up the mic, please? Thank you, Kuba. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Ah, super. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for the um, interesting uh, webinar. Uh, thank you, Guido. It's a question actually to to Guido on and on row crate. Actually, I was going to. Uh, put in the chat, uh, but I'll say it verbally. Um, for the for the research object crates, you said this is this is so it's actually endorsed as a standard or as a specification. I'm not trying to be picky, but I want to like this. This leads to the next question to see whether we can try and get some efforts ongoing. 
as part of the stand ICT, stand, ICT standards project that um, helps promote different specs or, or standardization efforts that can then hopefully go into the ICT rolling plan that's updated yearly. So we can try and get, I, I don't know if you, if you need extra support on this, but there's financial uh, support available to European experts working on this. I saw the, the website of Rocreate with, a, with a, an extensive community and um, I'd like to be able to see if we can provide more visibility on that. Uh, that's a question to me? It's a question to Guido, yes. Ah, right. Yeah. Um, first of all... We, sorry, Guido. We, we, that's quite right. No, well, to begin with, we will never say no to, uh, to offers of support with money. <laughs> sorry, facetious answer. In terms of standardization, um, uh, our create I know is its own standard, as in it has formed its own standards body and has, has been, obviously has been um, recognized in that respect, whether there is, I don't think there's a lot of standardization going on in terms of FAIR at the recognized higher layer standards bodies, such as ITF, W3C, et cetera. I, I am no expert here. There is, there is ongoing debate at RDA as to as to what 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 end-to-end -end system to ratify, but that's ongoing as far as I know, which was why I made the remark as to we had to pick something. And this one seems the liveliest to us. Um, and I noticed that Peter Sefton, who is one of the consultants who we've uh, who we've contracted with, who is in these standards bodies, is saying the ROCRED community is in contact with the RDA working groups and the FAIR working groups. And I, I think that's actually the that's as far as we've got so far. Anybody wanting to do something in this field needs to, to pick their winners and simply begin. There is, there is, though, very much a, uh, a de facto sense of standardization in that the repositories, you know, the, the repositories that matter, sort of the top three of the market, are all adopting our great. So in that respect, it's a relatively safe choice. Thanks, Guido. That, that's a fair answer. Uh, probably as a takeaway, then, maybe if we could take it offline and we can try and see if we can push it maybe into to one of the recognized bodies to, to, to have um, as part of their discussions. I don't know whether- I think, I think everybody's looking to RDA to finally make a recommendation, but it's been somewhat politicized for a while. So there isn't, there isn't a, an end all, and nor do I actually expect there ever to be an end all, but uh, a recommendation to, to end all of the recommendations. I, I don't think that's out there. Okay, we have uh, another question to you, Guido. Uh, so uh, from uh, John Samuel. John, would you like to ask your question? Or you prefer me to read the, what, what is in the chat? Oh, I see. Uh, on, on how many endangered languages have actually been covered. I must really be very humble here in that um, we merely we merely spotted the technical similarities in what Paradisac have covered and what we wanted to cover, and therefore we are adopting a lot of their technical infrastructure. I am by no means an expert in their science. Mm -hmm. I really ought to answer this one. It's an open platform, though, so anybody who uh, who simply types in the word Paradisac will end up with their um, with their platform, and it's free to browse. Okay, there is another question from uh, Alan Williams. Is there agreement on what metadata to specify? Again to me? Uh, probably, yes. <laughs> right. Well, um, most, most communities of practice, most scientific communities of practice do this by specifying a schema. Um, and the uh, Describo is very, very open to specifying your own schema. It starts from uh, schema.org. But if you, as a uh, as a specialist community, want to define your own, then in the user profile selection, you can select other uh, other schemas. But it it does try to because what it does what it tries to do is um, help users. Not I'm avoiding the word force, but help users pick a sane default. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of lofty language around what metadata ought to be filled in, but then. 
a year or two ago, there was a study into how many metadata attributes are actually filled in, even if you enforce a very rich schema. And it turns out that it's three. Author, file name, and sometimes things like date. But <laughs> you have to start with what works for people and not what works for librarians, unfortunately. So yes, there is extensibility, but trying to get uh, almost everybody to work with the same default is probably step number one, certainly for a middle brow open access system like ours that does not have librarian control uh, enforced from the top. Okay, thank you very much. There's plenty of questions flowing in, actually, so <laughs> we will have to try to, I'm here all night. to pick them up. Uh, so uh, there's another one on what is the novelty of this, this of Science Mesh compared to what already exists out there? Uh, anybody would like to answer, or perhaps I can start by answering, and maybe you can complement what 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 I would say. So I think the main novelty is that essentially we are bringing this functionality to where users already are and to where data already is. So we are not asking users to, uh, to go somewhere else in order to reach out to this uh, global collaborative uh, capabilities. We are essentially asking users to stay on the services that they're already, they're already using uh, uh, and uh, in this way, we lower the barrier for entry for them. So they essentially can continue to operate in the environment they already know, but we essentially extend with new capabilities, the services that they're already using. So this is probably an approach which is slightly different from, an, from perhaps some other approaches, which would ask users to move their activities or to move their data to somewhere else in order to be able to collaborate with others or in order to be uh, able to reach out to some functionalities which are not available in their home institution. Uh, and we try to be as pragmatic as possible to make it as easy for the users to use existing interfaces and existing mechanisms they already know in the sync and share systems how to share uh, their data and their files with other users. And we bring this capability beyond the boundary of their institution. And we do it in the ways which are, we believe compatible with uh, uh, all the rules that are being set up uh, of transparency, open access uh, that are being set up, uh, but also secure in a secure way, also in a tra traceable way, because we are all supporting uh, operations of very large scale services already. So we understand that this is an important issue to address as well. Uh, and the rules that have that are being set up by, by, for example, European Open Science Cloud. Anybody of my colleagues would like to add something to it? <laughs> I, I think the distributed aspect of it is also kind of a novelty. I mean, there are there are um, there's no shortage of sync and share solutions, even commercially. But um, the, this this idea that you 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 are a node in a, in a mesh of nodes that then can uh, interoperate, I think that's something. Okay, even if the concept itself is not is, is not new, the, the application to this uh, field, I think, is uh, um, at least I cannot think off the top of my head of any other solution which which works in the same way. And I, I, I could add on uh, my side as an also sync and share side operator, uh, that's uh, the concept of the, the mesh, which we work it out, gives uh, quite a lot of autonomy to the local um, local institution, local participant. Uh, from one hand, we, so we try to support uh, different uh, sync and share solutions, uh, which I mentioned in my presentation. On the other hand, uh, we could actually configure them in a way that's uh, Meet the, uh, meet the needs of our local community while in the same time being in the federation. So uh, the, the architecture and the concept doesn't doesn't break your typical workflow with your users. Your users see what they've seen before while they can have an extra features which result from the federation. Yep, thank you very much. There's another question uh, from uh, Maria Letizia. How does the science mesh fit in the European Open Science Cloud landscape? 
which is a very, very broad question because uh, EOSC landscape is a very, very broad landscape. Uh, what I would say is that, as you as you could see already from these application examples, we have um, one of the important components of our uh, of Science Mesh is uh, all the things that uh, uh, revolve around fair data and a fair approach to data. But our approach is essentially to enable this best fair, uh, the best practices of doing fair in the most practical terms taking good examples of what works in these particular user communities, such as Guido presented or Martin presented, and offer this in, uh, in a more streamlined way, streamlined way to others. So this is one of the aspects. Of course, we are using, um, we are using also uh, core EOSC services. We hope to integrate uh, Science Mesh as a service into the EOSC uh, catalog and to become one of the one of the services that are also offered. Um, we uh, follow the interoperability guidelines of EOSC, so essentially we are working a lot on making ensuring that all the outcomes and all the pieces, technology pieces that we are that we are developing and putting together here are interoperable. We are extending on existing uh, protocols and APIs that uh, are already acknowledged as uh, uh, as part of the interoperability landscape that EOSC needs. And there are probably many other many other aspects that I did not cover here, <laughs> which are relevant. But uh, uh, we would be very glad to discuss if you have any specific aspects in mind for EOSC. Uh, for EOSC landscape. Uh, we are at noon, uh, Central European time at least, and uh, uh, I think we still have several questions, perhaps uh, there's also a raised hand. Thank you for pointing me there. So, let me, where is the raised hand? Okay, so please, there is a person that raised the hand, Stian. Hello, sorry for skipping in so late. Uh, I saw there was a question about standardization of our crate. So I just want to point out that our crate is more of a set of best practices for how to capture metadata rather than a new specification because we're using existing standards. Uh, but of course, we're open to further standardize the kind of formalized part of that, you know, the way we structure the metadata and so on, but not exactly which types you use. Uh, but part of that would be also that, that we are making a fair profile that is more aligned with data site that would be more prescriptive. Uh, so that you have more things required to fill in. But in general, our credit is more open and so therefore do not have those restrictions. Okay, thank you very much for this comment. Well, uh, since I think we are running a little bit late now, uh, I would like to really encourage you to uh, perhaps uh, use all the communications channels that we do offer. Uh, so uh, Rita has just pointed in the in the in the chat uh, uh, a link uh, how to uh, get in touch with us so there's a contact link uh, in in the chat right now there's also a linkedin profile and twitter account we have a twitter profile if you're interested to follow up what's going on in the project there's also a newsletter if you'd like to if you'd like to um, to get to get the news from us and uh, so please use these opportunities if you'd like to um, if you'd like to keep in touch with us on perhaps your ideas or perhaps your further questions or, or discussion points of what is important for your particular community or your service if you'd like to somehow participate uh, in, uh, in 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 building uh, the science mesh or 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 or, or, or contributing in some other ways um, we are very open. We do it uh, completely in the open with the entire CS3 community. Uh, and uh, we, we welcome all good ideas, suggestions, and contributions. So 
perhaps we can wrap up here for the moment. Uh, thank you very much for this very nice uh, question and answers uh, session, which was very lively. Also, thanks a lot to all of my colleagues uh, who gave these very nice presentations and also to our support team at Trust IT who made this uh, webinar uh, possible for us. So um, thank you very much and uh, let's stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.